titled Revolution of the Deborah Samson Story. Before we begin, I'd like to thank you all for being here. It means a lot to have the support. But there are also many people who are involved in the process of creating this show that I'd like to thank. First off, Barbara Curtis Gaver for being my advisor on the project. And also special thanks to Dr. John Lawson for his suggestions for edits and revisions. They helped a lot. I actually started with an original script that was 42 pages long, and this one is about 20. Mm -hmm. So with his suggestions, I was able to about cut it in half so you can be here for a shorter amount of time. Um, I'd also like to thank my mom and grandma and my brother for all their emotional support. And I sent the script to mom multiple times saying, hey, I'm done with that one. Can you read this or I'm done with that too? Can you tell me how this feels from a non-theater objective or uh, perspective? Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone involved with the Women's History Month Committee. Um, they let me sit in on a few meetings and they put everything on their posters and they've really helped spreading the word. And along with the Honors Program and Professors Vendarian and Harold, um, the Department of English has also been pushing it out and many of them cannot be here due to other commitments. But having that support means so much to me. Um, and then Freedom Players for letting me do mock auditions and workshop some of the scenes that I was like, I'm not sure if these are going to work, but many of those made their way into the final production based on what I saw there. So thank you all for being here, and without further ado, present Revolution, the Deborah Samson story. Well, 
That is a part of the reason why I decided to do this lecture tour. I wanted to see more of this beautiful country before I was too old to travel. There you go again, Deborah. Always seeking new adventures. <laughs> I would be so nervous if I were you. Traveling without an escort, putting yourself in front of so many people, opening yourself up to criticism. Well, we all must take risks at some point, Mrs. Patterson. Some may say you've taken enough risks for you to last a lifetime. Do you think that I've made unnecessary choices in my life? It is just that your choices have not been the most satisfactory according to what is expected of you. I would think your husband must have a hard time keeping you in line at home, given that you are so disposed to taking charge of the situation. Well, I'm amazed that you have such strong opinions about my life. Deborah, you must be tired from your journey. It is been a long day for everyone. Let's retire for the evening. We can start fresh from the world. That may be so general, but I'm not ready to go to bed just yet. I'm no stranger to criticism, but when it comes from a friend, it hurts even worse. However, I can understand why Mrs. Patterson would criticize my choices. We are not cut from the same cloth. Please, explain your situation to me. You have repeatedly put yourself and your family in danger of ruining your reputation. I cannot understand how you could be so proud of yourself. You sound just like my mother and De Deacon Thomas. I'm sure you would have gotten along rather well with them. I'll tell you why I decided to risk so much. Think of it. Plimpton, Massachusetts, 1782. I was working as a school teacher and a weaver at the time when my guardians decided that they had better plans for my life. Deborah, why are you so against any suitor your mother finds for you? I'm not against her looking for a good husband for me. It's just that I'm not ready to be married yet. I need more time to be myself before I marry and have a family. Do we have to go through all of this again, Deacon Thomas? It seems that we do. Your opposition to marriage is not the only troubling issue. I've heard from multiple sources that you've been partaking in some very unladylike behaviors. What does it matter what people think of me? It matters to me, and it matters to your mother. Your actions reflect on not only your family's reputation, but also mine. You cannot be arguing with elders about religion, teaching your students about warrior women, and drinking in the taverns with soldiers. I'm not the one who ruined my family name. She can thank her husband for that. Do not bring your father into this. Why not? He forced our family apart. He's the reason I am who I am. That is a terrible thing to say. You're a much better person than he ever was. But Deborah, you really must consider what other people think of you. You're nearly 22. You were of marrying age years ago. Please. Honestly, Deborah, you have to face it. Marriage is on your horizon. There's so much I want to do before I get married. I don't want that responsibility. Then what do you want to do instead? Be a teacher for the rest of your life? What is wrong with being a teacher? You should be proud of me. It's no small feat for a girl who had never had proper schooling to become a school teacher. I'm proud of you for that. And besides, I want to travel. I don't want Clinton, Massachusetts to be the only city I see. You can't even call it a city. You can travel when you're married. Did my mother travel? Did she ever do anything she really wanted to do? Deborah, I know your life has not been ideal, but I know your mother would not change having you as a daughter and seeing you grow up the way you have. And I am thankful for being able to be part of helping you regardless of the fact that you were lying at your service. You've become part of my family. That's why I care so much. I'm sorry. And I should not have attacked you like that. Let's not remember. Now I must be going. My wife will be missing me at the farm. I hope we'll have a change of heart. Goodbye, David Thomas. Thank you so much. You should have listened to David Thomas. He had the right idea. But how could one simple argument push you to decide to disguise yourself as a man and enlist in the army? Well, that wasn't the only thing that spurred me into action. But there was just something inside me telling me that I had to do it. An internal desire to fight for the revolution? It, it was more like a fear that I wouldn't live up to what I was meant to do. Oh, how was that? Well, I had a dream, but it, it wasn't just any ordinary dream. And in fact, I had the same dream three separate times since the start of the war. What was it? I never told anyone but my friend Jenny. Jenny, please pass me my jacket. Miss Deborah, are you sure about all this? Surely there is some way. You can be more, but I will still look more like a lady. What? Like the others? I have many skills, but dealing with the functions of the human body are not one of them. Why don't you weave fabric for the uniforms? Everyone always wants you to weave for them. <laughs> and spend all of my time stuck indoors at the loom. No, I want to see some of this beautiful country before I die. This is the only way I can do it. I 
don't want to be trapped in Clinton forever. But Miss Deborah, what if they catch you? Don't you know what happened to Anne Bailey from Boston when they found her? The Continental Army arrested her and threw her in jail. Of course I know that, but I won't let fear stop me. I can't let this opportunity pass me by. But how can you be so sure this is going to work? I can't be sure. I just have a feeling that it will. Can you keep a secret? Well, I certainly hope so, since I've helped you this much already. I've never told anyone about this before, but I've had the same dream three times since the start of the war. The dream begins with the sun setting over the hills. Everything is fine. The herds are grazing, and farmers in the field where a gentle breeze is blowing. I'm amazed by what God has created. Then, to my astonishment and horror, the sky darkens, rain pours, and there's incessant lightning and tremendous pounds of thunder. I smell sulfur. I see waves the size of mountains formed in the ocean, and all the ships are at once dismasted, dashing against rocks and one another, or floundering amidst the surges. The farmers flee to safety. A volcano shakes the earth, and I see the most hideous serpent roll itself out of the ocean. As it comes towards me, and I run towards my home, the roads are drenched in blood. I faint. I wake up in my apartment. The door opens, and the serpent appears again in the most frightful form. He is immense. His mouth opens wide, and he bears his huge teeth. He slithers into the room and comes straight toward my bed, his head raised high, his eyes like balls of fire. I cover my head and I try to call for help, but I can make no sound. Then I hear a voice saying, Arise! Stand on your feet! Gird yourself and prepare to encounter your enemy! Enemy! I rise up, stand upon the bed, and the serpent begins to swallow me whole! I pray to God for help, and a bludgeon appears. I take it into my hands and pound away at the monster. The serpent retreats, lashing it. Lashing at me with its fishy tail. I pursue him, strike it till at length I dislocate every joint which falls to pieces to the ground. Next, the serpent transforms into an ox. He comes at me a second time, roaring and trying to gore me with his horns. I bludgeon him to pieces yet again. I go to gather them, but all I can find is a jelly. And I immediately awake. Miss Deborah, I'm no good at interpreting dreams, but I'm not so sure that's a good omen. I think it's telling me that I have to help slay our enemies. I'll be like Deborah in the Bible, leading the men to fight. But you might get caught, or worse, killed. Then you won't get to do anything you've dreamed about. Either way, I'm going to do it. I have to at least try. Well, how do I look? Miss Deborah, this is the most handsome you have ever been. Wish me luck, Jenny. Good luck, Miss Samson. I hope you make it. Thank you for everything. There's that stubbornness I know so well. I still think it's foolishness. You may think what you wish. Tell us what happened next. Well, everything went as planned. I successfully enlisted and collected my bounty. However, I did make one mistake. And what was that? That night, I, I went out to celebrate with some of the other recruits, and apparently I lost control of myself after a few drinks. I, I was so ashamed of myself that I could not show my face whenever we were all supposed to meet and begin our training. Oh, no. That's also when all of the rumors started. What rumors? Well, some people guessed that I might be dressing as a man. I, I suppose that I had gotten careless in my multiple tests of my disguise. One day, the elders of my church confronted me about these rumors. Hello, Miss Samson. How do you do, Miss Samson? Mm. Well, I know. What brings you out to the market today? We have come to talk to you. An alarming bit of information has made its way to us. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Did something happen to my students? No, 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 it's nothing like that. It concerns you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it? We have heard rumors that you have. I can't even bear to utter the words. We have heard rumors that you have been dressing in men's clothing and gallivanting around town in taverns and drinking with soldiers. Mm -hmm. Due to this speculation, we must inform you that the church is now in an unfortunate position. We must ask you not to return to worship at the Third Baptist Church. 
to the leadership of Valuers and membership in our congregation. Have a good afternoon, Ms. Sampson. We will inform you of our decision as soon as we have one.
After that, I decided to enlist in the Army for the second time. I was chosen to serve as a member of the Light Infantry, company of the 4th Massachusetts Reg Regiment. Oh yes, this is where our stories begin to cross. Before I volunteered to be your aide, General, I faced many hardships in the war. There were many days that I thought I wouldn't be able to make it through. I saw friends die by my side on the battlefield. I, I led numerous reconnaissance missions, and I was even wounded myself. But how did you manage to fool everyone? It astounds me that you were so successful in all of these endeavors. They all believed that I was just a young man who couldn't grow a beard yet. <laughs> they would give me a hard time about it, but they respected me for my enthusiasm. <laughs> it's really not that difficult to excel in such circumstances, as long as you have the ambition to accomplish your goals. Now, tell us more about your goals. How did you not have to be medically discharged? How did no one uncover your secret when they examined you in the field hospitals? I avoided them as much as I could. Well, when I couldn't, I never stayed in them long enough to be found out. When I was shot twice in the leg, my friends carried me to the hospital. When the nurse was tending to someone else, I stole the supplies I needed to extract the bullets and I fled. How dreadful. I can agree with you on that. I, I only managed to extract one of the bullets, and that's why I have so much trouble helping out on the farm. I never properly healed. Running a successful farm isn't very plausible if you have only one good leg. Is that why you decided to lecture this for? Uh, that's exactly why. I, I want to be able to support my family in any way that I can. I have tried petitioning Congress for my payments for my service, but it's, it's been a constant battle to receive any compensation from them just due to the peculiarity of my situation. Not everyone has the understanding that you had whenever you found out about my true identity. Oh yes, I want to know more about that. I've been pestering from my husband for years about that revelation. It's, it is all thanks to Benjamin Bonet. If he hadn't written me that letter, I would never have known. But how did he find out? Were you careless yet again? Oh, I had nothing to do with it. I'm sure you did. I have to take partial responsibility for this one. I sent Private Shirtliff into Philadelphia to deliver a message about the uprising of soldiers who were demanding their pay. I completely disregarded the fact that there was an epidemic ravaging the city. It was your fault. You sent your most valuable aid into the throes of disease? Could the message not be? We were only doing our jobs. The general could not have known that I would contract the fever that and collapse into the streets. I was scared nearly to death when I woke in the hospital the next day. But who was Benjamin Benet? Oh, he was the doctor who <laughs> saved my life. Good morning, soldier. I am Dr. Benjamin, Benjamin Benet. It is nice to see you awake. It's nice to be awake, Dr. Benet. My name is Robert, uh, Private Robert Shirtlip. How are you feeling, Private Shirtlip? That fever really took hold of you. I've been better, but I suppose I could be worse. How very true. Could you tell me what's happened to me since I've been here? Our nurses thought you were dead. You started to come through when some soldiers were auctioning off your belongings. We moved you here so you would be more comfortable while you recover. Thank you, but I'll be fine. I want to go back. General Patterson needs me. The general needs you to be healthy. You need to be healthy. I can take care of myself. I'm sure you can, but you don't have to. I'm happy to move to my house where my wife and I can tend you. It will be much more comfortable than this old hospital. Dr. Benet, you really do not have to show this hospitality to me. I promise I can recover just fine on my own. Ah, uh, yes. I'm sure you can s you're concerned. Remember, my profession requires me to be ma to maintain a certain level of confidentiality, but my services to the military demands that I uphold its values. I'm sure I don't know what you mean, sir. I believe you do. You're an intelligent person. How could you gather that? interaction with me was when I was unconscious. You see, Private, it takes cleverness to hoodwink an entire army, but it seems you have accomplished just that. So, I suppose you know... Yes. Bandages can help fix wounds, but they are also terrible at letting doctors listen to heartbeat. Dr. Penny, I beg you, please don't report me. I've come so far already. Shade my family would be if I was dishonorably discharged. I wouldn't be able to show my face in Clinton ever again. My church has already excommunicated me on suspicion alone. Getting agitated won't help. 
I'm sure you have fought bravely for your country. However, focus on recovering now. That would be nice. But will you end up... As I have said, I will have to inform the, your general eventually. However, that can wait until you are better. When the time comes to introduce you to my wife, what name shall I use? My name is Deborah Sampson. It's an honor to meet you, Deborah. I saved Dr. Benet's house with his wife and young daughter while I recovered. Mrs. Benet and I got along marvelously. In October of 1783, I was finally healthy enough to return to the army. Before I left, Dr. Benet gave me a letter to give to General Patterson. You could have easily destroyed the letter. John never would have known of its existence. Why did you let Dr. Benet expose your secret? I was petrified about delivering that letter, but I knew it was something that I had to do. While I was on the boat that was taking us back up the Hudson to West Point, a storm capsized the boat. As I swam towards shore, the river nearly carried the letter away from me. I knew this was my chance to be free of any guilt, but I grabbed the letter anyway. Everything that came next is history. I remember it well. Let's share it with my wife anyway. How did it go? You entered my office. I was so happy to see you again. Hello, General Patterson. Welcome back, Private Shirtliff. You have been missed around these parts. How are you feeling? Much better, sir. I cannot wait to come back. Well, now that you are here, let's get things back in order. I need you to run some errands for me. Uh, certainly, sir. It would be my pleasure. Before I go, I must deliver this letter to you from Dr. Benet in Philadelphia. I will read it to you. Have a chairman. Do you know the contents of this letter Dr. Bonet has written me? I cannot be certain, but I can guess at what he had to say. Although this letter seems to have suffered some water damage, it appears to say that Dr. Bonet believes that you are a woman named Deborah Sampson disguised as a man. Could he possibly be right? Dr. Bonet has no reason to deceive you. You mean to tell me that one of my most trusted aides, the epitome of a soldier and a respected leader within the Continental Army, has hoodwinked countless men into believing that she is a man? I cannot deny that the feminine sex is the one that I was born into, sir. However, with my deepest sincerity, I can only hope that you, as intelligent gentlemen such as yourself can see beyond my sex and remember only my contributions as you have known them to be made by Private Robert Shirtland. I am amazed at your efforts and dedication to our cause. Seeing as you have convinced us for nearly two years, I see, I see no reason as to why you should be punished for your service. In fact, you deserve nothing less than an honorable discharge for your service. I would be sad to see you. Thank you, General. Your words of affirmation mean the world to me. You know, Miss Samson, I cannot wrap my head around you being a woman. Just think of how the rest of the officers would react if you were to tell them. In fact, we should do just that. How quickly can you resume your feminine nature? Only as long as it takes me to find a gown. Wonderful. You can borrow my wife's gowns and she will help you prepare. I will send to the others immediately. I remember that evening. The two of you found so much enjoyment in astounding the other officers at dinner. They could not believe that Private Robert Shirtlift was a woman. <laughs> And in November, we set you on your way with a new outfit and mounted the trip. I was forever indebted to the two of you, and I'm so glad that our paths have crossed again. As am I. It has been so nice catching up with you, Deborah, but it is getting late. We should all get some rest before your big day tomorrow. Good night, Deborah. Good night. Are you coming, Elizabeth? I'll be there in a minute. Deborah. when you could have become a wife and led an ordinary life. Thank you for sharing your stories with me. Thank you, Elizabeth. You know, on the way here, I doubted whether or not I should actually see this lecture tour through its entirety. After Herman Mann published that biography about me, I received so much criticism from all sorts of people. 
Granted, I'm not sure whether his writing style was best suited for my story. After having this conversation with you, I'm much more confident that this is the right thing to do. You will be great. I think our country needs to hear more stories like yours. You have shown that women have accomplished what I had wish. You will be an inspiration to all those who hear your story. Good night, Deborah. Good night. While people flocked to the theater to listen to her address and to see her perform her drills dressed in her soldier's uniform, the Gannett family quickly spent almost all of just over their $100 she earned on their growing debts for medical bills that resulted from complications with the wounds Deborah had received during the war. Deborah continued to petition Congress for her pay for service serving as a soldier. Notable figures such as silversmith Paul Revere and poet, poet Philip Fernand wrote on her behalf. She would not receive payment until 1805, more than 20 years after the end of the war. Although Deborah fought bravely as a member of the Light Infantry, society refused to recognize her as a hero. Instead, they would mock her and insult her family by calling her the Old Soldier. Deborah Sampson Gannett died on April 27, 1827 at the age of 66. Deborah's contemporaries may not have been inspired by her, but her story has attracted many others from all walks of life throughout the course of history as they have found a connection with her struggles. There has been much speculation about the truth of Deborah's story throughout history. However, her story will always connect with people of many identities. As more people learn about her legacy, she received more recognition, and her legacy lives on. Daughter, indentured servant, caregiver, spinner, weaver, school teacher, theologian. Patriot, soldier, wife, mother, farmer, lecturer, businesswoman, veteran, and grandmother. The celebrated Deborah Sampson Gannett, the revolutionary.